This lecture will review the forced steady state response of one degree of freedom systems. Everything we've done so far has been free response or systems where there's no forcing on the right hand side. One of the most important types of forcing that we might have to consider is a harmonic forcing that could be either a sine or a cosine. But it's, a, it's harmonic in time and this will lead to some potentially severe consequences for dynamic systems as we'll see later. So whether the force is a sine or a cosine, in the reading it reviewed the fact that you can write that force as some real part of a constant, which in, which, um, in this case is real, but in general if we had a sine or a cosine or a combination, this could be a complex number. And um, so the forcing can be written this way. So the forcing basically has two features if it's a complex number. A complex number has real and imaginary part, or magnitude and phase. And so if that's the case, uh, we can make the assumption, and we call it an assumption, but it will end up being the true solution. So it, it's really something we know. But we can make the assumption then that if the force is harmonic, the response will be harmonic. And the only thing then we have to do is solve for the magnitude and phase of the response x. This little picture shows an example. So this is a one degree of freedom system with mass, stiffness, and damping. And it's subjected to the harmonic cosine force and um, it starts from some arbitrary initial conditions. Um, but anyway, um, notice that if we integrate the response in time long enough, eventually we get to the point that the, spon the response levels out and it reaches a steady state. And in steady state, the response is just a harmonic that repeats itself over and over and over again. So all of this is just a shortcut to be able to compute that final, that steady state response. So we need to remember that this is only in true and steady state. This is only true after everything has happened. But uh, the method we come up with is super easy. We get a simple little algebra problem to solve everything. And so we'll use it a lot. Okay, so let's do an example problem. After the reading, again, hopefully this will all seem pretty obvious, but uh, if we have this one degree of freedom system, just like on the other slide, and we're forcing it harmonically, here I haven't said whether F0 is uh, real or imaginary, this could be an arbitrary sinusoidal or cosinusoidal forcing. We make the assumption that the steady state response is some harmonic function as well that we can write as real part of x e to the i omega t. <clears throat> and if we do that and we plug that into the equation, we can simplify it down and get this. And again, I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but I'm assuming you can pick that up from the reading or you can ask questions in class if any of that didn't make sense. But basically, you know, we plug this in here, right? There we're going to get a k times capital X and e to the i omega t, and we pulled the real part to the outside. Here, if we take a derivative, x dot would be the real part of i omega x, e to the i omega t. And so that gives us an i omega cx, and so on. Again, hopefully that isn't surprising anyone. So, um, the only way that this can be satisfied, e to the i omega t will never be zero for all time. There's some instance in time where it might be zero. The only way this can be satisfied is if this here is zero. And so we solve for capital X and we get this expression right here. And it's important to note that even at this point, this is nothing more than a complex scalar, complex number. 
x is just um, an algebraic expression here, and that expression is a complex number that has magnitude and phase. And so um, in MATLAB, if we wanted to uh, find the magnitude and phase, we could just type all of this in just like that. And we could use abs to get the magnitude, and uh, we could use the angle to get the phase. So um, at this point, we're really done. But we can do a little bit of simplification to make it look a little better. If we divide through by the mass, remember k over m is the natural frequency squared. Um, likewise, c over m is this 2 zeta omega n. So we put it in this form, and we see something really interesting. That when the forcing frequency, remember this omega is the frequency we're driving the system at. That only has to do with the force. Omega n, this is a property of the system. It's a property of the it's the property of the masses and springs in the system. So um, when those two are equal, this part goes away. And what we're left with has theta, which is a small number. If we didn't have any damping, we'd have zero, and this would go to infinity. But in reality, we have damping, and we get, so we get a small number there, and that means big amplification. So more specifically, um, let's suppose we did want to find the response at omega equals the natural frequency, where the drive frequency is equal to the natural frequency. We plug in omega equals omega n up here. That simplifies down to this. And we can do a little more simplification here. Um, if we take this expression there, and we put the mass back in the denominator, m omega n squared, that's just k. So this actually we get a, an intuitive form here. And this is important because um, we can separate out a, a few different things. This is nothing more than a phase lag. It doesn't affect the amplitude at all. The f over k here, this is what we call the quasi-static response. If we didn't have any derivatives, if we're just doing a basic statics problem, you apply a force, um, you have a stiffness k, the displacement that you get is f over k, or f equals kx. So that's what we would get if we had a boring system that didn't have any dynamics. And here we have 1 over 2 times the damping ratio. This is our amplification or our dynamic amplification. Oops, can't spell. So that's what causes things to break. Now, um, using what we've reviewed on complex exponentials, you could actually sketch this all out without having to go to MATLAB. Let's just talk about that quickly. So our forcing was given as a real part f naught, uh, where was that, f naught e to the i omega t. So this is for the case where f naught is real. But um, so if, if that f naught was a real number, we'd draw it purely on the real axis with no imaginary part. This uh, vertical axis is the imaginary axis. And um, then if we plug in here, the minus i would mean that this vector x, this is the vector capital X, would have to be uh, down here along the negative imaginary axis. So notice there's 90 degrees of phase lag between those. We could use these pictures to plot the response. The real part of f, this is going to be maximum and then decreasing as we multiply this by e to the i omega t. So um, 
we get the sinusoidal picture that you see right here. And similarly, this one is has a, na a zero real part. And it's actually, oops, I drew that in. Oh, yeah, yep. And then it will become positive. And um, so it would look like this. And so there's a phase lag between these two, or in other words, it takes x of t 90 degrees longer to get to its peak than it does f of t. So we apply a force, and it's not till a while later that we see that manifest in the response. And then we also see this amplification that we talked about. So there's an example of how to do this by hand. Again, it's perfectly acceptable to do this in MATLAB or something. Um, and this is how you would solve the problem. If we had a case where the um, forcing wasn't near the natural frequency, then in that case we might get just a really small amplitude response. And actually the phase would be different, so I'm not going to try to sketch that without being more specific. Okay, so again, this is important because a lot of systems have light damping. And as the book shows, if we plot um, this magnification factor, this is like x over f. Um, x over f over k, I believe that is in the book. So it goes to 1. This should actually be a 0 down here. and There's a typo in the book and a 1 there. It goes to 1 as at 0 frequency. But anyway, the book shows if you have light damping, and 0.05% is actually pretty heavy damping for a structure, but notice if we drive at resonance, we get a factor of 10 amplification. And um, if we had zeta of 0.005, this might be a bare aluminum welded structure. The magnification there can be 100 times. So um, we get a big amplification in uh, vibration amplitude, which means a big ampl amplification in stress which means that the life of the part will go way down. And there are lots of examples um, we can see of this. These slides were shared with me by someone who works at Cummins, where they make everything from um, little tiny generators like you might throw in the back of your truck to um, huge generators, uh, thousands of kilowatts, these are basically like a mini power plant, and in some countries they use a bank of these as a power plant. Um, or they might power a hospital in a remote area or something like that. So, uh, as Steve noted here, um, why do we care about vibrations? Because things break, things make noise, and the cause is always a resonance. It's always a steady state response, or very often. These pictures show a drive shaft, and you can get a little bit of a sense of the scale there. Um, you know, this is at least an inch thick, and notice that it's sheared uh, completely apart. And that's due to resonance. That's due to cycle after cycle after cycle of deflection, 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 stress, stress, stress. And eventually, uh, no matter how thick you make it, eventually it'll break if the stress is high enough. Um, there have been some pretty high-profile uh, failures of things like this. If you look at these videos, it talks about a Lockheed Martin aircraft in the 60s where there was a problem with the engine mounts, which led to a vibration problem, a resonance. That actually caused the wings to fatigue and fall off, and all of the passengers were lost. So uh, this can be a serious thing in some industries. And a lot of other industries, it just is a nuisance that costs money and time. Um, this is a failure in an ex a plate, a component from an exhaust of a huge uh, diesel engine. And a lot of structures are designed kind of on this border between, um, you know, between failure and not. And if the rotation speed is right and the resonances stay where they're supposed to be, 
then we're safe and we don't have any failure. Um, but if something is, you know, something is designed a little bit incorrectly, Murphy's Law says that the uh, forcing frequency will always end up being exactly here if you don't do any planning and do any designing right. Forcing frequency will be equal to the natural frequency. Um, and so this is something we constantly have to worry about in industry. All right, so that covers everything in our review. The book also talks about the phase of the forced response. Phase usually doesn't matter because, you know, we don't necessarily care about the phase of the force and the response. We just want to know whether something will break in steady state. But it is useful to know about this because um, this can really be helpful uh, in l understanding when you have bad measurements. Um, for example, the phase, notice it should go through a nice kind of sharp 90 or 180 degree shift like that at every resonance. And if you have a multi-degree of freedom system, this will happen lots of times. Often when we take measurements, we'll see something like this. And uh, when you pass a hundred, when you pass a hundred eighty degrees, you come back down here, and then uh, you know you might go off. Well, let's see. Well, let's just draw it without the shift. You know, then you might go off this way. And um, anyway, those kinds of drifts and things can give you an indication that you have a problem in your measurements. And so it pays to know what to expect that to look like. All right, that concludes our lecture. I hope that helps you to um, remember what you've learned in the past or taught you uh, the basics of single degree.